Roundtable. Today's April 27th, 2015. We're at the Atlanta History Center in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, my name is Joe Bruckner. I'm a volunteer at the History Center. And with me today is Ed Woods, who is also a volunteer at the History Center, and Sue Verhoff, who is a senior archivist at the Atlanta History Center. We're honored to have with us today Mr. Tom Duggins. Uh, Mr. Duggins is a veteran of the U.S. Army, and he's agreed to come in and share his story with us in connection with the Library of Congress Veterans History Project. Uh, Mr. Duggins, we really appreciate you coming in and look forward to hearing your story. Could you give us your full name and your city and state of birth? My name, my full name is George Thomas Duggins. I go by Tom, and I was born in Louisville, Kentucky, June 26, 1945. Okay, and what city and state do you live in now? I live in Cumming, Georgia. Okay. Talk a little bit about your upbringing. It's, that part's sort of interesting. My mother was a nurse for 50 years, and my father worked for the L&N Railroad for 50 years. And uh, in the 40s, and probably before the 40s, uh, when she was working in pediatrics, um, newborns, they would sometimes have too many babies in the, in the hospital, so the nurses would take the babies home at night because they didn't have enough room for them. So she would do that, and she took me home. And uh, the next day, they asked, where's the baby? And she said, we want to keep him. So I was adopted by them, so I was very fortunate. Um, you know, I guess that doesn't happen as frequently today with abortions and, and all the pills and all that kind of stuff, but uh, I was very fortunate because I have no clue, never have wanted to know who my birth mother was or anything about that. So my parents are the ones that took me home from the hospital that day and, and kept me. And uh, they were, were basically a middle, lower middle class type family. And uh, my father never played any athletics in his life, but he was, a ad, he was an advocate for athletics. And he took me to games when he could, had to carry me because I was too, too small to walk. And so I kind of grew up in a gym just watching basketball and going to football stadiums and watching football. And that was the biggest break I think that I ever had because that got me involved in athletics at an early age. Some of it was peer pressure playing things like baseball because I really didn't care for it, but all my friends played it. And we were fortunate enough to live in a uh, neighborhood where there was a brand new high school built. And uh, this was in Louisville, and at the time in, in Kentucky, in Louisville, Jefferson County had their school system, and the city of Louisville had their school system. And so we were a county school. And this new high school called Seneca High School was built. It only went to the ninth grade, and they were going to add a grade each year. I was in the seventh grade, so I was in the first class that went all the way through the school, the six years there. Um, it was the first school in Jefferson County and one of the first in the South in 1957 that was totally integrated. And the interesting thing about that is, is it didn't make any difference. No one paid any attention to it. You know, it, was no, it wasn't a big deal. So uh, about a third of our school was uh, African American and uh, we, we played sports together. We did everything together and it just everybody was one. And that contributed to the school being very good in athletics. Um, we had a uh, the basketball coach that came there, it was his first time ever coaching a high school team. And by my senior year, we were ranked number one in the nation by Parade Magazine. Now, I had some great teammates. Uh, Wes Unsel, who's in the Basketball Hall of Fame, and then our best player was a fellow named Mike Ridd, who, uh, uh, Played at Kentucky Wesleyan, was like second or third leading scorer in the nation his, his uh, freshman year there. He only stayed there two years. But uh, that got me started, and a lot of people came to watch our team play, and that led to me getting a, a scholarship to the University of Georgia to play, uh, play basketball. How did your parents feel about you going that far away to college? Well, it was interesting because uh, growing up, my father was a uh, hardcore University of Kentucky fan, Adolph Rupp fan. In fact, he, he would, every time he'd see Adolph Rupp, he'd take me up to Adolph Rupp and say, Coach, 
my son's going to play for you someday. <laughs> and unfortunately, that was the only school in the state of Kentucky that didn't offer me a scholarship. <laughs> Wasn't quite good enough, I guess. But uh, we had some, he had a close friend that uh, went to church with us in Louisville that was from Athens, Georgia. And he was working for the General Electric plant in Atlanta that was brand new at the time. And uh, he had moved back to Athens. And so my parents felt very comfortable with me going to Athens mm -hmm. because he knew that uh, they were close by and if I ran into any problems and everything. Of yeah. course, you, you do run into problems. Yeah. You're homesick and, yeah. and stuff. And you think at times, I want to go home. Yeah. And it was easy to go over there and get a home-cooked <laughs> meal and everything and feel yeah. good about yeah. where I was. <laughs> Well, you've got a distinction in basketball at the university. You're, to I, talk about that. I was very fortunate. Uh, well, one of the reasons I went to the University of Georgia is when they showed me, uh, you know, when I visited the Coliseum there, the Stegman Coliseum, as it's called now, uh, was, was being built. And they put me in a, a continuing ed building, which I guess now is the Georgia Hotel, with a window overlooking the uh, building of the, of the uh, Coliseum. And uh, I got to play in the first game in the Coliseum and hit the first basket in the Coliseum. <laughs> and that was, uh, that was a great night. I played on a good, high, uh, good college freshman team. Back then, freshmen couldn't play varsity ball. It was the first time Georgia had ever signed five freshmen. And we were all about the same size. And uh, three of them came from Georgia, and then two of us came from out of state. One came from uh, Sarasota and then myself. But... Uh, we had a very good team, and we played Georgia Tech the opening night and uh, in the first game before the varsity, and uh, the place was full. They had 13,500 in attendance, and at the time it was the largest crowd ever to see a basketball game in the state of Georgia. And uh, the great thing was the people were there like two hours before the game because the Coliseum had won all kinds of uh, architectural awards because of the way it was constructed with the arches and then started the roof in the middle and then they finally built what was under the uh, roof later. And uh, I hit the first basket in the game and, and we won pretty big. But uh, it, was, it was quite a thrill. My parents were there and uh -huh. a, my best friend in high school had just happened to come to Athens to visit me that weekend from <laughs> Virginia Tech. Wow. That's a memory you'll never forget. Absolutely. <laughs> well, I tell about... people though, somebody had to hit the first basket. You know, <laughs> In our case, it was whoever had the ball first at that end of the court. <laughs> the guard had had a shot, he would have taken it, but he had to throw it to somebody, so it just happened to be me. So be it. Yeah. Talk about uh, what occurred between that point and you going into the military. Well, at the time, uh, Georgia being a land-grant school, I believe that's the reason they had to have ROTC. So uh, you take the first two years of ROTC, and then... Uh, uh, if you want to go into advanced ROTC, um, you, you can apply to go to advanced ROTC. In my case, uh, being on athletic scholarship, uh, I knew it was going to be sort of a time constraint, but, but I, I needed the $40 a month, to be honest with you. <laughs> um, my father sent me $10 a month, and that didn't go very far. And by the time you're a junior, you know, you want to go out with a girl every once in a while. And uh, so I, I said, I, I better, you couldn't have a job. So uh, I decided to go through our advanced ROTC, and I, I did that for two years, basically, again, just to get the $40 a month, <laughs> not realizing or not thinking what was going to happen at the end of those two years. <laughs> but it was, uh, it was a learning experience, and I, I did well in it. And uh, between my junior and senior year, I went to Fort Bragg for summer camp, and that's when you start, it starts hitting home that, I'm in the military, you know, or I will be in the military full time eventually. So did you go into the military right after you got out of Georgia? I graduated in August of 1967 and I was commissioned in August 1957, and, and, or excuse me, 67. And uh, th that was an important thing that happened. Got commissioned, but I didn't go in the army, uh, go on active duty until January of um, 68 and uh, January 68 I went to, a, uh, uh, my first choice was military police. So I went to uh, military police school at Fort Gordon, I believe it was nine weeks. 
there. And I went through the, the school and everything. And while I was there, I got orders that my first assignment was going to be Fort Hancock, New Jersey. And uh, it didn't say what I was going to do. I was just going to be attached to an attachment. Now, you know, in, when you're going through it, you, you learn what a company is, a battalion, and a platoon. I had no clue what an attachment was. And I had no clue where Fort Hancock, New Jersey was. So I got the map out and started looking. You know, you don't have the computers or anything back then. And realized that Fort Hancock, New Jersey was at the tip of Sandy Hook Park. It's a state park in New Jersey on the coast of uh, New Jersey by Highlands, New Jersey. And uh, reading up on it a little bit, Fort Hancock uh, housed the uh, personnel that worked with Highlands Army Air Defense Site. So it was a, a Nike missile site, and they had uh, the uh, Highlands Army Air Defense uh, people were on a hill overlooking Highlands, and it was the main uh, 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 protection for New York City from an attack. Yeah. So uh, I went up there, still not understanding quite what an attachment was, so I, I went there and reported to the uh, provost marshal at Fort Hancock. And I walked in the office and uh, I went in and did my salute and all this stuff, you know, not knowing how formal or informal this thing was going to be. And uh, the guy stood up and he said, uh, what is your date of rank? I said, August, whatever date it was, 1967. He said, welcome to your new office. I said, what do you mean? He said, you outrank me. So he was commissioned in, I believe, September of 67. So now, not only am I an attachment, I don't know quite what it is, I'm the provost marshal of this missile site as a second <laughs> lieutenant just out of MP school. And uh, uh, Fort Hancock is also the first army, at the time was the first army rec area. So we're on the beach and everything, and we had... Uh, um, People, families would come there for summer vacation from, uh, you know, a lot of the First Army, people who were in the First Army area. they bring their families. They had all these, uh, uh, I guess, hotel room-like things and barracks yeah. and everything. So it was a quite active uh, place to be. <laughs> so uh, I had 39 people. And most of them were people who had, uh, the people had returned from either Korea or uh, Vietnam, and they were waiting to... Um, be discharged from the army. So some of them had six months, some of them had nine months to go. So they put them in my uh, attachment. Yeah. What were your responsibilities? Well, as a provost marshal, I mean, it was like I was the police chief of uh, Army's Air, uh, Highlands Army Air Defense Site and Fort Hancock. And uh, it, 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 you had a lot of problems because uh, the way the current is, the water current there, we got uh, from, I got there in uh, March from uh, MP school. And the way the currents are, people can, bodies, either thrown in the water by somebody or jump in themselves or drown at sea, or some cases we had people who were buried at sea. The first one we got was a, a Russian sailor. They float into us, the way the currents were. Huh. So my first night there, I get a knock on the door about 2 o'clock in the morning and say, we have a floater. <laughs> I said, well, what is a floater? <laughs> and it was a Russian sailor who was buried at sea, floated into our, on our, onto our beach. Jeez. So we had, we had two or three a month. And you get a lot of fishermen down there. So that was the other thing. Fishermen at Sandy Hook, would just keep wandering down the beach, and there wasn't a there was a sign, but there you know, um, they uh, I guess March, April, May, and June it's a great fishing time up there. I'm not a fisherman, so I don't, I'm not sure what they were fishing for, but uh, they'd wander down there. Well, we had to you know patrol that and keep them away because you had the missiles yeah. at, at that area. So it was it was interesting from that standpoint, and uh, you know we just patrolled the area and everything, and just mo most of it was just minor stuff other than the bodies, and we turned them over to uh, 
the military uh, version of the FBI, or CIA, or whatever. So you didn't get involved in the more mundane MP activities like uh, breaking up bars, bar fights? No, it was, too, it was actually too small. You know, you have the problems with uh, uh, an officer's daughter going out with an enlisted man or something, and the officer, you know, the colonel. We had a lot of colonels there. And, and again, a lot of them were people who were waiting to be um, retired from the Army, yeah. and they would send them there. They were artillery types and stuff because of the missile site. So they would come to me and say, is there anything you can do about, you know, private so-and-so seeing my daughter? Well, not really. <laughs> well, if you see him on the beach or anything at night, will you please bring him to me? So, we, we, you know, we had stuff like that. So it was, it was really, it was crazy from that standpoint. But it was, it was kind of enjoyable, but you think you're lost. I mean, it's not the Army. You know, it wasn't a, going through MP school. It wasn't what I learned in MP school. I mean, some of it was. I'm, I had to do reports. I had to report to a, uh, a colonel at um, Fort Hamilton, New York. We were all under his. Uh, there was like three or four small forts in that area. And we all had to report to him, and I had to go like once a month to a meeting. But uh, it wasn't anything like I had mentally yeah. thought of as the Army. And then uh, all of a sudden, in, uh, I guess it was the first part of October of 1968, I've got, I get a, uh, uh, a message and it said, you are to report to, Fort, to uh, Travis Air Force Base on such and such date for um, your flight to Vietnam. I thought they'd forgotten about me. <laughs> and I was, I was happy with that. <laughs> So uh, I immediately started looking into what I had to do, and they uh, sent me to Fort Dix for uh, an orientation, you know, how to use an M16, because we didn't, we didn't use M16s in military school, and, and uh, uh, we, that's not what we had there. Yeah. So it was, uh, 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 it was a kind of a wake-up call that now the military is calling. Now, we did have one incident uh, during the time I was at... Uh, Fort Hancock, which was kind of interesting and scary because they were having riots because uh, Dr. Martin Luther King had been uh, shot. And so we were put on alert to have to go to D.C. because we were close enough to D.C. And I'm thinking, why would they want the 39 of us? But we had to go through drills with gas masks and huh. riot control and all that stuff. And, and none of these guys had been through any of that kind of stuff. And, yeah. and it was a mixed group. I mean, we had about, about half of us were, were white and, and the rest yeah. of them African-American. Yeah. And we're, none of us real, really knew what to expect if we got called or why we would even be called. So we, we did go through some exercises and, and things like that to prepare ourselves if, if we did get called or if they just said send 10 people right. or whatever. Yeah. But that was the only uh, real excitement I guess we had there besides <laughs> what happened on the beach. That wasn't all that bad, was it? <laughs> no, no. And, and uh, I got married uh, while I was there to a girl I dated in high school. Right. And um, she moved up there. Our first house, uh, married housing, we were in a, a building, a house built in 1860 something. See, this fort was built in the early 1800s. Oh, okay. And. Uh, they still had uh, no concrete uh, barracks that they, they'd had. They weren't using those, yeah. but they, you could see the gun turrets in there where they had uh, guns set up to fight, you know, anybody coming into New York uh, Harbor. How about that? And uh, so our first house, we were overlooking the Atlantic Ocean, so it was pretty good, yeah. pretty good deal from that standpoint. Good start. Yeah. Plus, we had a Coast Guard station there. If you needed to go into New York, once I found out you could go into New York and go to the USO, and get tickets to uh, plays. Oh, yeah. uh, you go to Madison Square Garden and see sporting events. Go to see the Mets play, or uh, oh. they weren't any good back then. But yeah. Yankees or anything, you could you could do that. Yeah. So Coast Guard would give me a ride over there. <laughs> they'd take a group over. They didn't have anything to do, so they'd <laughs> take us over there and then come pick us up. Man, you had the best assignment of the army. That's why. That's why you. you I was hoping that they just uh, maybe they forgot about me. <laughs> Series in they did, yeah, yeah. But they, but '67 or '68, they weren't that good, you know. <laughs> I go see them play the uh, Braves or, or you know, back then. Yeah. But I got the, the orders, and I okay. went to Fort Dix and spent. Uh, I, I don't know if it, was, it seems like it was like a week to have this orientation and everything. You got, so you had stateside uh, 
uh, fatigues. So now you had to get these jungle fatigues and, and get the uh, patches and all that kind of mm -hmm. stuff sold on and everything. It's not like they uh, give you a list of things to take with you to Vietnam. And I, as you can see from my scrapbook, I'm a pack rat. So I thought I was supposed to take everything I owned to uh, Vietnam with me. So I took too much, obviously, and uh, ended up, as soon as I got there, sending it, sending it home. How'd your parents feel about you going to Vietnam? Uh, it, it didn't go over real well. Uh, my dad, uh, uh, the year I was there, he had, uh, he had some real issues and everything, and, and uh, he, he missed a lot of work because he was just depressed yeah. and everything. And my mother uh, suffered from mental illness uh, uh, quite a bit throughout my life. Mm -hmm. And um, she, she struggled with it too, but probably not, she didn't realize the situation as much as he did. Yeah. And uh, they both had, had problems with it. Yeah. Um, they, uh, um, they made it through and everything, but it was, uh, it, was, it was probably a lot tougher on them than anybody else. Yeah. And my new wife, um, she just went, she moved back home to live with her parents you know, for that year. Yeah. Okay. So when did you get to Vietnam? It was uh, October, I, I arrived on November 1st, 1968. Okay. And uh, when I was at Travis Air Force Base, you know, I'm looking around and I saw a few people I'd been to mil uh, military police school with. And they were, we were all going to different places and we were on different flights. So I got to talk to them, but yeah. you know, it was one of those things, I knew I was only gonna be in for two years or only believed I was gonna be in for the two years. I didn't really try to make a lot of friends because you know, I, I don't know, just mentally I, I said, this isn't the place to make long, long lifelong friends. Yeah. Um, so I, I talked to them and everything, but the TV was on and this, uh, it was a, it was like a airline terminal, even though it was in an air force base. And President Johnson was speaking that night. So the night that we were going to leave, in the middle of the night, he's he's given the speech where he stopped the bombing of North Vietnam. Oh. Well, you know, for all of us, it's over. Yeah. It's, we're going to go over there. And they're going to send us right home because the war is over. Yeah. So that's that was our thinking all the way over there. And. Yeah. You know, you're on a plane, and, and it was it was an interesting ride over there. I'm sure you you experienced the same thing where you, you get on the plane. It was a um, American Airlines plane, and uh, the flight attendants were, were almost beautiful on the flight to to Hawaii, and then they changed crews, and they changed a little bit, <laughs> and then you go to Guam, and it changes again, and you say. Whoa! This is getting this isn't going in the right direction. But uh, you start realizing when you get to Guam and, and you, they give you the speech that when you get off the plane to stretch your legs and everything, don't take pictures, don't don't do this. You know, give them all these don't yeah. do this thing. You realize well, this is a serious thing we're going to. And then we landed in uh, uh, I can't remember the name of the place, but it was close to Benoit. Okay. Uh, I guess was the main welcoming station in Vietnam. And we're getting off the plane. The plane doesn't turn the engines off. And we're walking toward this uh, 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 shelter, and there's people walking toward the plane. So, I mean, it's not like today where they clean up the plane and everything else. They're getting on almost as fast as we're getting off. And I remember the taunting. It didn't matter if it was... You're, you're, you're an officer and they were private or whatever. There was a lot of laughing at you and everything, you know, say, uh oh, this isn't good. <laughs> but uh, I knew my time would come sooner or later. Yeah. But you, we went to this uh, sheltered area and then they bust us to, uh, uh, excuse me, it, we landed Ben while I went to Long Ben, okay. is where they, uh, they sent us. And um, my first, we got there in the morning or mid, midday. I realized that was the day of the Georgia-Florida football game. And I had a transistor, transistor 
And some something came up about, uh, I went to Georgia and some guy said, well, you know, it's on the armed, the, they're playing Florida on the armed forces radio station tonight. Now, it's because the time difference was like in the middle of the night. I said, no, I didn't realize that. So, you know, I got, we, we were all in bunks and stuff. I was in an officer's area, but we, we still had bunks and everything. And I'm listening to the Georgia Florida game, and that was the year Georgia beat them. I think it was 48 to nothing or something, and yeah. pouring down rain. And uh, all of a sudden, there's incoming. So my first day there, first night there, there's incoming, and there's no mistake in what this is. You know, you've heard it, you guys. So you, you, you immediately, what do we do? So everybody going to a bunker and everything. I go to the bunker for a while. There's no more incoming. So I said, well, I'm going to go back in and listen to the game. So I went back in and wasn't anybody, the rest of these guys were scared, more scared than me. I was just stupid. If I go back in, I take a bunch of mattresses and get on the floor, and I'm listening to the, the, the rest of the broadcast of the game with about four mattresses over me, not even thinking that, you know, uh, some incoming guys could bust through that without any problem. First things first, right? That's right. I had my priorities correct. But... Uh, so that was my first night there, and it seems like I spent a couple of days there, and then they, 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 they uh, you know, they give you some more equipment and stuff. I guess uh, uh, maybe that's where I got my jungle fatigues. I'm not sure. And then they assigned me to the 25th Infantry Division, so now I'm going to my new home. And uh, first time I'd ever been in a helicopter, first time I'd ever been in a helicopter with uh, doors open. So that was kind of an interesting experience, especially for somebody that's scared of height. So we land at uh, Coochie, where the 25th Infantry Division is, and I go to the, uh, uh, I guess, where people go when, when you arrive and everything. And they also do a, a orientation, and they had both officers and enlisted men combined in that. And they also talked to you about where you're going to be assigned and everything. And they came to me, and he said, we, we don't have a job for you. I said, well, I can go home. <laughs> you know, it's not that bad a deal flying back home. But the military police didn't have a, a job for me. So we got some places we'd like for you to go and see if you can get a job. So this is a little strange. So this was my first interview. I guess they were like the uh, employment agency or something. So the first place I went was to 1st uh, uh, Battalion, 5th Mechanized Infantry battalion and uh, went there reported to the colonel and he said I'm not sure why they sent you here I, I don't really know what I'd do with you I said I'm not sure either but I but I like the guy and he said he told me he liked me so he said well, we'll try to work something out and uh, he was a West Pointer and it was the greatest thing that ever happened to me because I ended up in a, a battalion with mostly West Pointers as officers captain above and so that gave me a degree of confidence knowing that they knew what they were doing and uh, he uh, started me out in the S4 uh, uh, office in <coughs> supply and, and everything he said we eventually want to make you the property book officer I said that's fine I don't know what a property book officer is but I'll, I'll do it until I found out I, I would have to sign for 122 million dollars worth of equipment <laughs> That was a problem for me. But uh, during the first few months I was there, uh, lieutenants were uh, disappearing for various reasons. They either get injured, killed, or transferring back. So I, I told him I'd do whatever you want me to do. So for a couple of weeks, I, I spent some time with the Flame Platoon when they didn't have a, a platoon leader, and a couple of weeks with the Four Deuce Platoon at a fire support base. Uh, working with them. Now, I knew something about the, four, the mortars, but I didn't know anything about flame. But we had a good sergeant that, uh, you know, guided me through what we had to do there and everything. So and then once, once that first uh, six or seven weeks were finished, then I settled in in the uh, S4 property officer's thing. And it was, it was interesting because, you know, we'd run convoys out to the fire support bases. We'd send uh, supplies out on Chinooks. We'd go out on the Chinooks to, to bring stuff out. And I also had to go to the brigade headquarters to ask for equipment. And that became, uh, that was a challenge for me 
uh, quite a bit there. I got in a little trouble on that. Because of what you were doing to try to get the well, supplies? Well, the biggest problem was concertina wire, the, the bob wire that they use. And uh, they wanted you, the brigade headquarters, when you'd have to go ask for it, they always said, well, why didn't you all pick up your, the old wire? Well, you do a little bit, but it's hard to get people to pick that stuff up. You know, it's, it's, it's pretty dangerous. And, and so, yeah, we, we probably didn't do a good job. We might have been able to do a better job of keeping some of the old, but the uh, problem was we didn't have it, so we needed more. And so it was almost like having to beg for it. So I, I wrote a letter to my congressman about it. Somebody said, well, write your congressman. The, the brigade guy, uh, the S4 there told me, he said, why don't you write your congressman? You don't jest. Well, I did. That set off a firestorm a little bit. You know, all of a sudden, I, I'm called in to our colonel, and he said, what have you done? And uh, I told him and told him why, and he understood, and he appreciated the effort that I was doing. He said, but that's probably not the best way to do it. Probably should have gotten me involved before you wrote your congressman. I said, well, I will next time, you know. But I didn't have any problem after that getting whatever I needed and everything. And uh, so it was, it was an interesting... Uh, uh, group of people I worked with are, are, you know, worked with everybody since we were in supply and everything. Um, I got on a building kick over there. Uh, at the S4 shop, we decided, uh, you know, we all were tired of the, the way the latrines were. I said, well, once I found out that the Air Force had everything, and, and we, had all, we had all kinds of uh, captured enemy weapons, and the Air Force would do anything for weapons. You know, enemy weapons. So, and and Saigon was only about 25, 30 miles away from Kuchi, so I could take enemy weapons up there and trade it for a, a flushing toilet, and I get that. And once I found out I could do that, I could get plywood. So we we started building things. We built an officers uh, club. We built an NCO club. We we built uh, new shire facilities. It was all because we traded enemy weapons for uh, for these things, <laughs> and uh, in my scrapbook, there's there's pictures of these things we built, and uh, that that helps get your mind off of yeah. the reason you're there, and you know uh, when you had to go out and spend time at a fire support base and the dangers of that, at least you could come back there and do some carpenter work and hit a hammer <laughs> against the nail, you know. You, uh, that was a good build. training for a business career. Yeah. And I found we had some uh, fellows that liked to play basketball, and we all got tired of playing basketball on dirt. So my, my biggest uh, building challenge was how are we going to have a uh, nice basketball court? So they had two dump truck loads of uh, asphalt there adding on the runway at Tonsonut, which is outside of Saigon. And uh, we worked out some arrangements there and brought them to Kuchi and, and dumped that asphalt. And we had a very nice basketball court <laughs> that we used. And they used it at night to show movies. They, you know, they show movies yeah. outside. On, on a, they had some big, two big pieces of plywood they put up there for guys to watch the movies. Well, you were probably a hero to those guys. Uh, I got along with everybody. You know, <laughs> it's just, I mean, everybody respected rank over there, but it was it's a little bit different in a war zone than it is... Uh, yeah. You know, uh, when I was in Fort Hancock, New Jersey, you know, and the colonels all, uh, they, they were a certain type. If, if I'd had to spend two years in a Fort Hancock, New Jersey, I would have gone crazy, I think. If I'd had Vietnam before New Jersey, then I might have uh, considered staying in the military because it was enjoyable working with people who knew what they were doing. Yeah. And, uh, you know, they were serious when they needed to be serious, and we got the job accomplished, what we needed to do. Now, Coochie is where... It a lot of the tunnels were, weren't they? Tunnels of Kuchi, yeah. In fact, that's our our, our uh, flushing toilet flushed into a tunnel. And the tunnel was big enough to drive a five-ton truck through. Um, and we were always hoping that uh, there were still some North Vietnamese or, uh, or Viet Cong wandering through the tunnel, <laughs> you know, aimlessly. But uh, the uh, sergeant in our uh, S-4... Knew, knew how to use explosives and stuff, so he uh, he blew us a good hole down <laughs> down to it. They weren't that they weren't that far down, but 
I never went into the tunnels, but they were big. I mean, uh, the people went in them. They had hospitals that they'd had in them yeah. and, and everything. And while you were there was a time when we were discovering the tunnels and yes. going down in there. We were finding they were a lot bigger, you know, they were a lot bigger than we thought. Yeah. And I wasn't there for the, the major Tet Offensive, which was in uh, January 68, but I was there for what we call Little Tet in 69. And uh, that, that was an interesting experience. They, they, uh, it wasn't as big as the first one, but they still tried to do the... Uh, 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 what, what they call it, where they uh, they have a first wave come across and fall on, you know, when they get killed, yeah, they fall yeah, on the wires, and the yeah. next ones would make it a little bit further. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, everybody everybody had their guns, and everybody was trying to protect, you know, our place huh. during that. And, and you uh, were part of that? Yes. Um, Talk about your feelings during that, while that was going on. I Hard to have feelings when something like that's happening, but yeah, you, you, I didn't. I've kind of, you know, you look back on that, and uh, I think about it. So the, the the one thing I remember about it was outside our main gate. They had all these. We collected all or people collected all these bodies of people, and they were human beings. They stacked them up, and it was like uh, must have been fifteen, twenty feet high outside our main gate. But uh, they belonged to somebody. So they put them out there for a period of time for families to come see if they get their kin. And they were out there for like, uh, seemed like two days or three days stuff. And I saw that and, you know, you, you realize that we, we, just, we just did this, but if we hadn't done it to them, they were going to do it to us. Yeah. And they might have stacked us up outside. Yeah. Uh, but I just, uh, my my time there was uh, I was numb. I, let's say I was numb. I, I, you know, I was very good friends with with people, like the captain I worked with. Uh, he was an African American uh, career uh, person, Captain Morris. Uh, we were very close and everything. I went to see him one time when he was at Fort Benning. After I got out, we spent about an hour together. Never, I've never spoke to him since. But it, it wasn't because we had any hard feelings or something, but it was just we, we worked together there, and everybody you worked with, you worked closely with, but I just didn't become real close to them. Now, I've got yeah. friends who go to reunions of uh, their unit and everything, but I don't think my unit was like that. We didn't go over there together, yeah. and a lot of them went over together and then uh, spent the year together, but uh, yeah. we didn't, and it was just, you, you went there for a year and you went home. Yeah. Um, in fact, after my friend went to his last reunion, I got online just to see if there was any sort of uh, reunion of anything. And there's some, there's some, but nothing I, I recognize yeah. as being people that I would be involved with. Yeah. Did you go on R&R &R at all while you were there? Went on R&R &R to Hawaii. Everybody I was around seemed to like to go to Australia, but I was homesick and, and went to, on R&R &R to Hawaii. Yeah. Met my wife there, yeah. and uh, uh, our daughter was conceived in Hawaii oh. for R and R. So I've got a lasting memory yeah. of, of R and R. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that was uh, she didn't recognize me when I went there, and I, you know, I was worried I wouldn't recognize her. But I, I'd gone from about 240 pounds. I was in pretty good shape at 240 pounds but I was down to 185, so she had to bring all new clothes for me because I didn't have yeah. any civilian type clothes. Yeah. And I told her I weighed 185, she, she had trouble. I hadn't, I hadn't weighed 185 since the ninth grade. Gee, huh. So. How much time did you have left in country after you got back from R&R? &R? Six months. I went, and it was interesting because my first uh, six months there, I didn't think I was coming home. You know, once I saw all the stuff going on and the incoming, you know, I just, I, I was, uh, I, don't, I don't, I'm not a negative person, but I just, I just said, this is going to be difficult to get out of this mess, you know, alive. Because I'm seeing so many people that are not making it and um, lieutenants and the various units and stuff. And uh, I was very negative, but after R&R, &R, I went back, I was determined, I was, I wasn't going to die for something that I didn't understand or, or anything. It wasn't a, I wasn't necessarily against the war. I wasn't any war, don't get me wrong. Yeah. But uh, I just didn't think the, uh, a lot of the people over there were worth my life. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I was going to do everything I could to stay alive. 
Did you have any dealings with the locals at all, the, the Vietnamese? No. No, the only dealings I had with them were in Saigon. I, the sergeant I worked with, I only kept $10 a month. Because I didn't, what am I going to spend money on? But for that $10 a month, I could buy two cases of beer and one-fifth of, uh, <laughs> of, uh, uh, of uh, what did we buy? Jack Daniels. We could take it to uh, Saigon and sell it to a hotel there. This guy ran a hotel, Vietnamese guy. And I would come back with like $45. <laughs> so I said, this is a good deal. Once a month. So my last uh, four or five months, we did that. <laughs> and uh, he'd do the same thing. Yeah. I don't know if it was legal or illegal or what, but uh, got me a little extra spending money. Yeah. Then I'd turn right around and, and uh, you know, go to go someplace and spend it yeah. in the bar or something. Yeah. Air, we had a helicopter unit next to us, and they had pizzas in the microwave. So it was about a six inch pizza. So we could get the, get a pizza for like three bucks or something, you know, it was probably worth 50 cents. <laughs> so we'd turn right around and spend our money, I'd spend it there. Did you have as much action the second six months as you did the first six months? I don't think so. The, the, the second six months, it was rainy season, most of it. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it was more just trying to, I mean, it was, it was you get those, uh, uh, when it'd be raining, it'd be raining hard. And, you know, we had to, our bunkers had to be above ground versus below ground. And so you're adjusting to all that and then getting supplies out to the field and everything. It was, uh, it doesn't. I don't. I don't recall it being as much incoming or anything yeah. as as we had that first six months. Yeah. Uh. Seemed like things were slowing down a little bit. And in fact, the uh, colonel called me and he said, "I'd like for you to work <coughs> on a plan to move our battalion back to uh, Hawaii, Sch Schofield Barracks. That's where they were from." So that gave me a little. Um, so you know, I'd stay up late at night working on a plan how much, you know, what we needed to yeah. move and how to move it because we were planning to take everything back. Huh. Did the unit move back? Did you move back with the unit or no. did you leave before no, they No, they were there a couple more years. Oh, they did. Yeah. But they are, they are at, uh, last I, I checked, they were, they're at Schofield Barracks, that unit. Okay. Are there any experiences those last few months that uh, you remember that you want to share? Not really. You, you know, the first in the first six months, we had my first Thanksgiving away from home, my first Christmas away from home. Yeah. Uh, those are things. You, those are the things you remember the most. You know, what did you do on those? You know, and I saw my first. Uh, Bob Hope Christmas show in person rather than seeing it on TV. Well, talk about that a little bit because. Almost everybody our age has at least seen them on TV. What, what was that like being there in person? Oh, it was a great thrill. You know, uh, when we knew he was coming, you know, you, you're a little worried because, you know, you start thinking, boy, getting a big group of people together like that, I mean, it's a perfect target and everything. So you're a little leery about it, but then you get there and he's funny. And uh, Ann Margaret was in the show yeah. and, and uh, uh, Forgot who else was there. There was two or three other people, and they were all funny. They were they were so personable, and the jokes. You know, I guess they, some of them were corny, but we still laughed at them. And uh, he was just he was just so great, and, and it was something we all looked forward to. Yeah. And, and once we all gathered and everything, and I mean it was it was truly a, a gathering of, of almost everybody that was stationed there at Coochie. You know, we we recognize our helicopters flying all around. So for anybody to try to do anything to us, it would have been they would, it would have been a death mission on their part probably. But it was probably uh, it was a great two hours, and and I think it was we did it right before Christmas. I guess it was a week before Christmas, and then Christmas it made Christmas a little bit easier. Yeah. And uh, we had a good chaplain in our uh, battalion, and he had a, he had a. Christmas Eve service and one on Christmas Day, and you know we had a special meal and everything. Mm -hmm. So that was all. Uh, that that was that was as good a situation as you could have being away from family yeah, and everything. Yeah. And my family had a. Uh, we had Christmas before I left. You know, I got Christmas presents uh, yeah. 
in the, the week before I left and everything. So that was that was nice. That was nice, yeah. yeah. But uh, I thought that you know, and again, I don't know what other divisions did or anything, but uh, our the division commander, and I, I forgot who it was at the 25th Infantry Division, but he insisted on like several times a week, everybody gets ice cream. It wasn't going to be soft ice cream. This is whether you were in the field or in Coochie. So when I was at the fire support base, it was really a thrill to get this ice cream. I mean, get an ice cream bar out there. Wow. You know, the thing would be hard. Well, when you're in supply, you got to get it out there. So I saw both sides of the yeah. thing. But I thought it was, uh, I, I thought it was really a, a good thing. And we, yeah. we made sure everybody got hot meals, too. You didn't just eat the sea rations all the time. Um, so it was, I was, I couldn't have been in a better division. I'm, I'm sure people in, in first cab and all that stuff, people went probably the same way about theirs. But, uh, I was very, very thankful I ended up where I did. Sounds like he cared about his men. They did. They, they really did. And, and then again, in our unit with all the West Pointers and stuff, they were. Uh, they knew what they were doing. Yeah. They, they they were all career, so they. Uh, uh, you really felt comfortable when you start looking at plans and yeah. things you had to do. Um, you, you had a, de a high degree of confidence that it was going to be for okay. the best. Now, you know, we we had, we had some ambushes that surprised us right. and everything, but uh, for the most part, it, everything was pretty smooth during that year. Um, you know, when you get to that last week, I saw a statistic or something on, I don't know if it was on the, the current conflicts we're in now, but uh, a lot of people um, get injured or, or killed, yeah. you know, like a week before they, they return and stuff. And I think it's probably the same way over there because you, yeah. you get too careful. It's just like in athletics. If you're injured and you get too careful and you don't want to uh, injure yourself anymore, that's when you really get hurt bad. You got to give it, go 100%. And um, so that last week in Vietnam, that, that was that was probably the toughest week. Yeah. Because you're ready to go home. You, you've got the date. You know where you're going to go and everything. And, and uh, it was, uh, that, uh, you, you're very careful what you do. Did you have a short timer's calendar? No. <laughs> no. I just, I, kn I knew the date right here okay. <laughs> and uh, planned accordingly. Talk about the experience of actually leaving and then landing in California. Okay, yeah, we, we went back to Travis Air Force Base and then I was going to uh, Oakland Army Depot to be uh, 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 get out of the Army. So I was actually getting out of the Army early. And this was October 30th, 1969, so I was getting out two months early. Okay. So it worked out good for me because my wife was... Uh, uh, eight months pregnant, six months pregnant at that time, so I was going to be able to be home and, and, and everything. Um, but at Oakland was was interesting. They, they kind of heard you through. You know, I was with officers, uh, mostly first lieutenants. We were all first lieutenants by that time, and uh, you know, you, you got your first meal and everything. And I remember the bus ride from Travis to Oakland because. Even though we'd only been away for a year, they changed the models of cars, you know, the body style. Mm -hmm. So we're looking out the window, what is that? You know, so you're, you're looking at cars and everything. And uh, that, that, was, that was the thing that really stood out is what, what changed over here. And um, I always find it interesting that these, these, these people in the service today, when they go on what their R&R &R is, they, they go home, they literally go home. Yeah. And that would be difficult, I think, to, to say, well, I'm, I'm home, I don't want to go back. You know, yeah. Hawaii or Australia or something like that is not that big a deal, yeah. but uh, I, I think that would be uh, very difficult. But yeah. we just, we were all looking at the changes and everything. And uh, the night in Oakland, football game, Georgia and Kentucky. <laughs> and uh, I had to go up on the roof of the building to get a station far enough east that I could get the game on the radio. You know, nothing nothing was on TV. Oh, WS, so, so I had to, Yeah, yeah. So when it was early in the evening there because it was a night game in Lexington. Oh, yeah. And uh, 
actually the night before I left to go to Travis, I went to the, the uh, uh, well, it was like four days before I went to Travis, I, I went to the Kentucky-Georgia game in uh, Lexington. So now I'm going to this, listening to this thing, and it was it was it was fun. It was kind of makes you the adjustment part. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm back yeah. home now. <laughs> but uh, after they uh, process you through this thing, and they were all very helpful, as I recall. And it was nice eating the meals that we had. I think we got a steak even. And I'm not a big steak eater, but it tasted pretty good. Yeah. Then we went to the San Francisco airport, and I I. I'd only been around these guys for three or four hours or whatever the evening before, and we go to the, the airport, and we were just kind of, you know, being in San Francisco where the uh, uh, a lot of the protests and stuff were, and, uh, you know, people looking at you strange, and we, of course, we were looking at them kind of strange, too, because they were dressed yeah. kind of strange yeah. uh, compared to what we were used to. Um, it, that, that was kind of interesting where nobody really talked to you, and yeah. it was kind of stay away you know yeah. you're military but uh, the ride home was on a uh, it's a four engine propeller plane that I left San Francisco and my first stop was in St. Louis so I knew I was getting closer yeah. and that that was just uh, it was an all-nighter it was a, a red eye so got to Louisville about eight or nine in the morning and that was just a big relief for everybody and I remember yeah. Went, went home, went to my parents' house, my wife, and I was tired. We, we, had, we talked a little bit, and I, I was tired. I wanted to go to bed. So I went to bed for a while, and I remember I was in bed for about two hours, and my dad starts yelling at me, are we going to do sleep all day? <laughs> Just like he did when I was growing up. So I, I knew everything's fine yeah. at that point, you know. You knew you were back home. Yeah. But I was back home. I had a wife pregnant and uh, didn't have a job. And... Uh, I'm out of the military now. Now what do I do? And uh, so then I started a new uh, new venture. Where we'll talk about that. Talk about a little bit about what you did following your military experience. Well, when I was my last month or two in Vietnam, I started writing companies. You know, seeing if I could find some place to that would interview me. Because if you've never done it, you you don't know what to do. So of course I wrote Coca Cola and people like that thinking. You know, maybe this will lead to an interview or something. But I got nice letters back from them. But I majored in uh, personnel management at uh, Georgia, and there wasn't a big demand for that. So I came, I told my wife, I said, listen, I want to go to Atlanta and look for a job because of the association with the University of Georgia first, because Louisville just didn't have that many opportunities. And I figured, I thought maybe I could utilize the Georgia connection better. So I, I came to Atlanta. We came, uh, stayed at North Druid Hills in 85. And that, that's important because there was a building next door to the, it's behind Howard Johnson's there. I don't know if it's still there or not. So we're staying there. And I'd gone to a uh, employment agency. And I was a little naive there. I didn't realize employment agencies work for companies, not the, the individuals. So, but they sent me on some interviews and they kept sending me to banks and insurance companies. And they would give me tests. And I could, I could handle most of the tests, but I didn't do well at all. It wasn't like I'd been sitting for the last year reading books and, and studying or anything. You know, I'd been in a jungle situation, yeah. and the lighting wasn't real good. So at night, I didn't do a lot of reading. And, uh, but the people were all real nice, and they gave me some suggestions and everything. So I was getting frustrated. It was Thursday of the week. We'd, we'd been there since Sunday. And I looked at the building next door, and it said Safeco. I said, I wonder what they do. I said, I'm gonna, I didn't have anything going until about 11 o'clock that day. So I went over there about 8.30, walked in there and saw the receptionist. And I said, do you have a, uh, back then we called it personnel department versus HR. I said, do you have a personnel manager here? She said, yes. Do you have an appointment? I said, no, but I'd like to speak to, to the person. So this guy came out and we started talking. And... Uh, he said, I got somebody I want you to meet. So he called uh, the, a gentleman down there, and he'd gone to Georgia, and he was a big sports fan at Georgia, and we started talking and everything. So next thing I know, I'm calling the people up that I'm supposed to meet at 11 and tell them I'm, 
I'm, I'm going to be real late. You know, it's going to be three or four more hours because I'm tied up with something. I stayed there and, and started. Uh, next thing I knew, I was interviewing with a lot of different people. Went back the next day and interviewed with some more people. They offered me a job. And the, the person who offered me the job said, this is probably one of the biggest mistakes I've ever made. I, I said, well, I said, I, I think I'll prove you wrong on that. He said, but, you know, you, you generally don't hire somebody that's moving to the area for the first time and uh, hasn't had any job experience, work experience in an office, and I'm probably making a big mistake, but I like you. So I said, thank you for giving me the opportunity. Now, the guy with the Georgia connection, he, he didn't think it was a mistake. And he was right. I, I stayed with him for 24 years wow. and moved around, and I left when— uh, the third time they asked me to move to Seattle, and I, I had to say no. Mm -hmm. But uh, it started a career. Safeco is an insurance company, or was. They've been bought by Liberty Mutual now. So I had a 43-year insurance wow. career, mostly in commercial insurance, and mostly in just general commercial. And then I got involved in public entity insurance. And in my last 12 years, I de dealt with uh, national programs sharing all the golf-related business for St. Paul and then Travelers when they bought St. Paul, oh. Girl Scouts of America, uh, daycare programs and stuff like that, countrywide. So it was a, it was a fun career oh. and everything. But had I not walked over there, and it was funny because about six months after I was working, the uh, personnel manager, uh, Jack Parker, came to me and he says, I need to talk to you. I said, okay. So I went down to his office. He said, we forgot to test you when we hired you. I said, oh, oh that's a mistake on your part, Jack. <laughs> he said, will you take a test? Would you mind taking the test? I said, yeah, I'm not going to take a test. Because I knew I'd already established my I said, you take it and put my name on it. I said, I don't care what you do. I said, I'm not, I'm not going to take a test. He said, we're about to get audited. I said, you got a problem. I said, I'm not going to take a test. Because he, he told me he was going to, I had to take the test and he was going to backdate it. Back to, I said, no. <laughs> so uh, I don't know what he did. But uh, it, it worked out well for them and me. And, and I had, had, a, had a good career in management good. and insurance. Uh, met a lot of nice people and everything. And you're retired now, huh, sir? Retired now. Retired uh, June 30th, 2011. Now, from a personal life standpoint, uh, my, my first marriage lasted about 20 years. And uh, I don't know, I don't, I don't blame anything on Vietnam. I don't blame anything on, on anything. It's just, uh, it didn't work out. You know, it, it got to the point that um, it, it just, it wasn't gonna work out. We had a beautiful daughter and uh, she went on, she, she's in the insurance business now. And, wow. and uh, so that didn't work out. But for the last 25 years, I, I, I got remarried about, two and a half years after uh, we were divorced and uh, yeah. we're celebrating our 25th anniversary this year. So I feel like I've been married all my life, yeah. but uh, I've, I've married a wonderful woman now and, and a dog, she's a dog, yeah, of course. likes Georgia That's, imp sports. that's important. Yep. So it's, 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 life's been pretty good. Well, congratulations on that 25 years. Thank you. Thank you. I want to give uh, Sue and Ed a chance to ask any questions you want to ask before we wrap up. I was just curious about that passing, the guys coming and the guys going passing. When I arrived. When arrived I wondered how that played out when you went home. Did I didn't you, do that. Didn't do that. I didn't do that because I remembered how I felt. Now, people around me did that, but I didn't do it. In fact, I was just, I just wanted to get on that airplane and see it take off. But that, that uh, when you get off that plane and they don't turn the engines off, that's a strange feeling. Yeah. Uh, you know, because you know it's not going to be sitting there very long. Yeah. Uh, and I didn't want to make anybody feel like I, like I felt on that. And I want to give you one more chance to say anything you want to say about anything before we close it up. You don't have to say anything, but if anything you want to say, and I also want you to show a couple of pictures out of that book. You've got okay. one that has two photos and then your headshot. Uh, okay. 
show those on camera just so we can see them. No, you know, uh, I don't. I don't know if this is a. I don't want this to be a political statement, but you know, I was in the non-voluntary army. I guess I was a volunteer in the fact that I went through ROTC, and I have a, a, a nephew who's in the uh, Army Reserves now, and he's he's he, he's been very active. Been to Iraq a few times, so he and I have a lot of debates. He's a captain. We have debates on whether the army today is better than the army before when people got drafted. And personally, I believe that uh, a lot changed in this country when we did away with the draft. I, I think it's probably one of the worst things we, we've ever done because um, people were more loyal, it seems like. People were more understanding of, of uh, they took more ownership in the United States of America. And uh, uh, I just, uh, I, I was I was fortunate enough. I was with good people, good people that knew what they were doing. The career officers were the best. I mean, they knew what they were doing, and I just hate to see uh, today uh, the situation where maybe a lot of people aren't as qualified as we were. We had people in our um, administration part in our battalion that had law degrees from UVA. I remember two in particular, and uh, they got drafted. And um, so you were working with some really sharp people. It wasn't just people just yeah. off the street decided I can't get a job somewhere and I'm going to join yeah. the military. Yeah. So yeah. that was that, that's something that stands out with me in, in, as far as yeah. the military goes. Yeah. But there were a lot of talent in the military back then. Yeah. Show those two pictures, particularly the one with, with the headshot. I think that would be a good closing page. I've, I've marked you it. You marked it, yeah. Napkin. Yeah, this was, uh, it's hard to hold it up though. <laughs> you, you want me to help you with the book? Yeah, yeah that, was, that, that was taken in uh, Vietnam in, the, in our brigade. They, they said we're going to have a picture day because we're getting ready to do our album. I said, what do you mean our album? And they said it's like a uh, yearbook in high school. <laughs> so, and I got the yearbook, you know, and, and so they took the picture. They said, yeah. we're clean fatigues. So they did it. Everybody in the, in the battalion is in the yearbook. Wow. And it was very nicely done and everything. Yeah. So. What a good thing to have to keep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's some names in there that whenever I go to watch you know, I always go to the wall and I see, I see some of the names that were in the book and everything. Yeah. That's emotional. Yes, it is. Very. Well, I can't tell you how much we appreciate you coming in here and sharing your story. I mean, you you obviously faced enemy fire and you're very modest about it, but you were involved in a lot of incidents that could have been very serious had it not worked out a different way. Right. I mean, you were in the line of fire. And you also deserve a lot of credit for your leadership. I mean, what you did, exchanging the weapons for things and build, you know, putting in the toilets and building the basketball courts, you made your men's life better. I think everything you do in life, you know, the experience you just build on it, uh, the way my parents brought me up, me and the modest lifestyle that we had, taught me a lot of things. I didn't have everything that everybody else in our school did because besides uh, uh, the way our school was, about half the school was probably in the upper income of, of the Louisville area. And then you had half of us that weren't. Um, so that, that, that helped me. My high school coach was, was one of the greatest influences on my life. Uh, the, the years I spent around him and what he taught me Taking account of being accountable for things, being a leader. I was a uh, co-captain my senior year. I was a co-captain my senior year at Georgia on the basketball team. So you learn things from those things that you do. When I went to the summer camp between my junior and senior year, I won some leadership awards there in the uh, mortar contest in the um, uh, track stuff where we do running and stuff. Um, I took some leadership in, in those things. So all that stuff builds, and then, of course, your business career. It really helps you yeah. in your business career. 
Now, one, one other thing happened that was really interesting. A, a, a fellow that I went to high school with played basketball with us. I think he, he lives in... I'm sorry. No, it's okay. He lives in the Atlanta area, so we we invited him about two years over for two years ago over for dinner, and uh, he and I were talking. He's I said, "Were you in the army?" Yes. I mean, we, we really literally hadn't seen each other or known him. Were you in the army? Yes. Where were you? I was in, I was in Vietnam. Where? Kuchi. I said, "You're kidding." When were you there? He was there at the exact same time I was there. He was in an artillery unit. And he, but he was on the other side of Coochie than where I was. Now, you know, what, 20,000 soldiers or maybe 25,000 soldiers part of the 25th Infantry Division and the hospital and, and all that stuff. We never ran into each other. But uh, he was in the artillery. And I, and I, I, I mentioned a, a situation that they had with the artillery. One day during lunch in their mess hall, a uh, cleaning person, Vietnamese person was in the cleaning put a mortar in the trays so when somebody pulled the trays out, it went off, killed about 15 of them and injured maybe 30 or 40 more. Yeah. And I asked him about that incident. He said he was he, he was standing outside talking to somebody or he would have been in there when that took place. Wow. So he was surprised that I remembered that, but I mean that was, you know, that showed that it didn't matter, you weren't safe anywhere. It's either uh, your time or it's not. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the poor guy that pulled that tray out, I mean, he, yeah. had, he had no chance. Yeah. And, you know, he thought he was in a safe place. But oh. it was interesting talking to this guy, and then we, we got out the scrapbook, and he started oh. seeing some of the pictures of Coochie and some of the things there, so he brought back memories. Yeah, and, that had to be sort of special. Yeah, yeah. Him. I've seen him a few more times since Good. then, you know. Good. But uh, that, that was interesting. Well, I, I can't thank you enough for coming in here and sharing your story. I mean, it really, again, thank you and thank you for all you did for the country and thank you for your service. Well, I appreciate it, Joe. Thank you. Thank you.